please welcome Atlantic Senior Vice President and the General Manager of Atlantic Live, Candace Montgomery. Good afternoon, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for joining us at our In Pursuit of Happiness Forum. I'm Candace Montgomery, Senior Vice President and General Manager of Atlantic Live. If you were with us this morning, we're happy to have you back. If it's your first time, welcome. We've assembled a stellar lineup this afternoon to help you and help us deepen our understanding of the principles and work needed to pursue what truly brings enduring happiness. Please silence your cell phones, but keep them close by. We'd love to hear your thoughts about In Pursuit of Happiness, so be sure to share a few words on social using hashtag TAF23. Now I'd like to introduce Arthur Brooks, Atlantic contributing writer and author of new book, Build the Life You Want, The Art and Science of Getting Happier, to kick us off. Thank you all for joining us this afternoon. Enjoy the show. Hey. Thank you. Thank you so very much. What a delight to see all of you and have an opportunity to talk, to kick off this session on my favorite topic, which is happiness. I am the most privileged person perhaps in the world because that's what I do for a living is write, speak, and teach about the science of happiness. I'm trained as a social scientist and, and at this point in my career, I get to teach a class on the science of happiness at the Harvard Business School and write about it for the best magazine in the world. What a wonderful privilege that is. Now, when people meet you in the United States for the first time, they always ask you the question, what do you do? That's how you break the ice, at parties in America. I also have lived about you know, half of my adult life in Spain, where the icebreaker question is, where are you going on vacation? <laughs> That's a mentally healthier question to ask. But be that as it may, when people ask what I do for a living, I say, well, among other things, I teach at a business school. And they say, well, marketing, finance, Accounting, supply chain management, something <laughs> practical like that. I say, no, I teach happiness, and they, th they think I'm lying. <laughs> but it's true. As a matter of fact, it's a class that's now so oversubscribed that I have 180 students, I have 400 on the waiting list, and there's even an illegal Zoom link they think I don't know about. <laughs> so what are we teaching them in the happiness class? This is not a a feel-good kind of thing. This is no woo-woo at all. On the contrary, this is a science class about how you can manage your life, which is the reason that my column in The Atlantic is called How to Build a Life. And my new book is Build the Life You Want that, 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 that suggests there's some action to it. Now, on my first day of class, I start off with this question to the students. Look, you, you spent all your elective points. We have a market at, at HBS, as you might imagine. You, you spent all your elective points to get into the happiness class. You must know what it is. What's happiness? And I cold call them. And I'll pick somebody out of the, the first class, and they always say the same kind of thing. It's the feeling I get when I'm with the people that I love. It's how I feel when I'm doing what I enjoy. And I say, wrong. <laughs> happiness is not a feeling. And that's incredibly good news. If happiness were just a feeling, you'd be chasing it and hoping to get it, and Good luck. It would have to do with how you slept last night or what you ate for breakfast or whether you got yelled at by your spouse or whatever. Happiness is not a feeling. Feelings are evidence of happiness, kind of like the smell of the turkey is evidence of your Thanksgiving dinner. No, happiness is something more tangible than that. And so we start off with a little definition, and let's do that now. Happiness is a combination of three things, just as your Thanksgiving dinner is a combination of three macronutrients, namely protein, carbohydrates, and fat. Your happiness is a combination of enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. Those are the three parts of happiness. Now, this is incredibly good news, friends. Some of you have high and intense negative feelings, and some of you are more ebullient and naturally really happy because of your feelings. We're all different. But the truth of the matter is that if we understand the component parts of happiness, we can study, get better at, change our habits, share, and become happier people. Enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose. Now, I only have six minutes here to kick off this session, so I can't give you the whole semester. <laughs> but I will tell you that to get more enjoyment and satisfaction and purpose in your life, you really 
you really need only to do four things. You need to have a portfolio of four habits. There's a lot of stuff that goes into happiness you don't need to worry about. Don't worry about your genetics. They control a lot of your mood from moment to moment, it's true. But if you have your habits right, you manage your genetics. And don't worry about your circumstances, good and bad, your bad luck and your good luck. That affects your happiness too, but it comes and goes. Worry about the things that you can manage. What should you be thinking about? What's in your happiness investment plan? What's your happiness 401k? Four things. Your faith, your family, your friends, and your work. Now, let me tell you briefly what all of these things are and what they have in common. Let me tell you what they're not. When I say faith, I don't mean my faith. I'm a Catholic. I like it. But I'm a social scientist. And I will tell you that it's much broader than a specific religion. It's not even a religion, necessarily. It's not even spiritual, necessarily. It's a, a perspective on life that's bigger than you. It's a notion that life can transcend your narrow existence. Why? Because you need to get small if you want to be happy. Otherwise, life is just exhausting and boring and tedious. My job, my commute, my money, my sandwich, it's horrible. <laughs> it's like watching the same episode of the same sitcom over and over and over again compulsively without relief. You need peace and perspective, and you can get that in many ways. Maybe studying the stoic masters, maybe walking in nature without devices, maybe studying the fugues of Johann Sebastian Bach, maybe a meditation practice, or maybe like me, the faith of your youth. But you must do something. Faith. Family. Family life. Defined in different ways for different people, but you know who they are, and you know if you're not talking to them and you have a schism, how painful that is. Sometimes it's inevitable. In cases of abuse, I got it. But let me tell you a shocking fact about America today. One in six of us is not speaking to a direct family member because of politics. That, my friends, is insane. Abuse is one thing, but differences of opinion are not abuse. Don't do that to yourself. Third is friendship. Now, friendship seems pretty straightforward, but, but it isn't, is it? I work with a lot of very successful people. Over the course of what I do, I teach at the Harvard Business School right for the Atlantic. So I meet a lot of people that are really God, going on. And they're so lonely. They're, they're surrounded by people all day. Leaders, they're so lonely. Why? I'll ask, how many friends do you have? Hundreds. That means zero. <laughs> Why? Because if you tell me you have 300 friends, you know what they all have in common? They're deal friends, not real friends. You know the difference between real friends and deal friends? Deal friends are useful. Real friends are useless. <laughs> I don't mean worthless. I have those too. <laughs> Do you have enough useless friends? Number three. And last but not least, it's, it's work. But when I talk about work, I'm not talking about a high paying job or a prestigious job. No, no, no. I'm talking about just two characteristics. I've looked at public sector, private sector, nonprofit sector, above average income, below average income, high education, low education, blue collar, white collar, no collar. I've looked at every kind of job. None of that stuff matters for joy. What really matters is just two characteristics, and these are the two things to look for. And if you employ people, give them. Number one is you need to earn your success, to feel like you're creating value with your work and that it's being recognized and rewarded. That's number one. Number two, you need to serve other people, and you need to know who they are. You need to be able to get a face in your mind of somebody who actually needs you, which is the basis of, of happiness that comes through work. Earn success and service to others. So that's what I mean when I say faith, family, friends, and work, so that you can get all of the, 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 the enjoyment, satisfaction, and purpose that makes up the happiness that can make you the happiest person that you could possibly be. So what, in six minutes, I've given you a lot of material. It's probably been seven. Let me leave you with the one thing that will make you remember it all, the linchpin for all of this stuff. Because people ask me all the time, you know, you teach science of happiness and you write about it every single week. That's a lot to remember. Tell me one thing to remember. What's the big idea? There is a big idea. Faith, family, friends, and work, love of the divine, Love of your family, love of your friends, love of everybody through the way you earn your daily bread. 
This is the punchline of it all. If you want to remember one thing to get happier over the course of your life, to dedicate your ideas to, your energy to, your affection to, your attention to, it's love. My last word is this as we go on to the important conversations that we're going to have with Bob Waldinger and Cheryl Strayed. And we're going to talk about so many facets of this in the coming minutes. Is that happiness, my friends, is love. Let's live that, and life will just get better and better. Thank you. And now for a conversation on the science of health, please welcome Robert Walden, author and professor of psychiatry at Harvard Medical School, with Julie Beck, senior editor at The Atlantic. Thanks so much for joining us. Hi. Um, so let's just get right to it. OK. Um, so you're in charge of this huge study of human happiness, the Harvard Study of Adult Development. Can you just give us a quick overview of like what is the study's mission and you know what, what makes it unique? The study started in 1938. I'm the fourth director. I'm not that well preserved. But, <laughs> um, and it was actually studied, it started as two studies in Boston that didn't know about each other, uh -huh. a study of Harvard College undergraduates and a study of boys from Boston's poorest and most troubled families. Mm -hmm. And both of them were meant to be studies of what help people thrive as they go through life. So the Harvard guy's a no-brainer, but the inner city guys, mm -hmm. the question was, how did they manage to stay on good developmental paths? And that was radical for that time. So the study's been going on for 85 years. So I'm assuming there's been some changes made along the way. Can you tell me a little bit about how the study's evolved? Yes. Um, first, if, if you want to study normal young adult development, you study all white men from Harvard? No. <laughs> so Mr. we're all, you think. Yeah, yeah, we're always having to explain to NIH why they should continue to fund us. So we've brought in spouses, we've brought in children, more than half of whom are female. Um, and then we've changed so many methods. I mean, we used to do medical exams and interviews, and we still do, mm -hmm. but now we draw blood for DNA. Mm. DNA wasn't even imagined in 1938. Well, so I think maybe we're glossing over possibly the most interesting thing about the study, which is you, you take the same people and you follow them through their whole lives, right? Right. Um, so, so what does that let you learn that a lot of other studies on happiness maybe can't capture? Well, most studies do snapshots of people. Mm -hmm. You know, we could study 20-year-olds and 40-year-olds today. And, you know, but, but when you get to ask people the same questions, you get to draw a little map, a little trajectory of their life. And we do this with thousands of people. Yeah. So, so in summing up the findings of this study, I'm most curious, like, from following people all through their lives, what is the difference between what people think will make them happy and then what actually ends up making them happy? Yeah. Well, all of our people, when they were starting out on their careers, thought that being wealthy and being famous and winning lots of awards was going to do it for them, and it just didn't. Did any of them get famous? Some of them like did. John F. Kennedy was part of our study. Oh, okay. Ben Bradley, longtime editor of the Bo mm -hmm. you know, Washington Post. Actually, the Boston Strangler was part of our oh, study. Oh, no. I don't, how happy was he? Yeah, yeah, no, he, was, he didn't He wasn't it. too it happy. It didn't go okay. well for him, Great, no. great, great. But, uh, <laughs> but, but, what, but what we found was that people thought when they were starting out as adults that, they, that, that wealth and fame and achievement were going to make them happy. And everybody, when we asked them to look back in their 80s on what they were proudest of, mm -hmm. it wasn't any of that. It was, I was a good father. I was a good mentor. I was a good friend. Um, so it was all about their connections with other people. Why do you think we get distracted? Like, do we just not think about our own mortality enough? That's not really a joke. That's a serious question. Well, it's true. I mean, I, I'm a Zen practitioner, and we talk about mortality all the time. But, uh, and it turns out that that makes us happier, remembering that time is short. Yeah. Um, but you know, if you think about it, relationships, which is the most powerful predictor of well-being in our scientific work, 
relationships have been there since before we had words. And so they're like the air we breathe. So we never stop and think, well, how am I doing in that realm of my life? Mm -hmm. uh, and it's not measurable in the same way that, you know, money mm -hmm. or awards are measurable. Yeah. Well, I was thinking a lot about basically that main finding of the study that the most important thing for our happiness is our relationships. And like, it's not surprising, right? Like, it's, it's important, but it's not surprising because I think, you know, we are basically just apes. Like, we're a social species. Like, I think all of us know on some level that our relationships are really important for our happiness. Yeah. So if we know this, then like, why do we struggle to do it? Well, two things. One is that the surprise for us wasn't that good relationships kept people happier. It was that it also kept them healthier and they live longer. So we mm -hmm. live longer if we have good relationships. And we at first thought that can't be a real finding. And then yeah. many other studies began to find the same thing. But then the, your question is so important. Why don't we pay more attention to our relationships? And besides taking them for granted, they're complicated. You know, mm -hmm. every relationship of any significance has conflict, um, is confusing at times. And so they take work and they take continual work. And I think that's one of the things that makes it a little easier to keep them on the back burner. Yeah, I know. For me, it's like I, I actually think about this a lot because I like, report on friendships and community. And so I really want to try to prioritize my friendships and my community. But like it does feel hard. Like it feels sometimes like swimming upstream of like forces that are pulling you to other things. Like, do you ever feel that way? Yes, I do. And, and many times people say, you know, I have so much going on in my life. And now you're telling me I have to tend to my friendships and my family. But I think what, well, you know, like. They, do they phrase it like that? Right, they do. I've had people <laughs> phrase it like that. I just don't have time for that. But I think, you know, what, what we found, and when we studied all these people, what we found was that the people who were good at this just took small actions over and over again, and that that's what makes a difference. So if you think about it, um, you could all think of somebody right now who you miss and don't see enough, and you could just send them a little text or a little note, right? Mm -hmm. We could do that every day, make sure that we're with the people we care about. And when we studied these lives, mm -hmm. those were the people who were the happiest, the least stressed, and felt that life was most worthwhile. And the, t the texting is a tough one. Like, I do think the like, currency of modern friendship is texts, and I'm very bad at texting, so I do need to work on that. Um, I'm going to look at my notes for a sec because I just want to get this study right. But um, there was a 2019 study in the U.S. that found that three out of four adults felt moderate to high levels of loneliness. And, like, I know the pandemic did not make that better, right? right? So for this epidemic of loneliness, right, as the Surgeon General likes to call it, how much of it is something that's structural or beyond our control? Like how much can we blame the pandemic, society, and how much can be changed by our daily choices? Well, there are lots of these factors that are not in our control. Even how our cities are structured, how our jobs are structured, the mobility of our societies, all of that mm -hmm. makes for more loneliness. And social media makes many people feel lonely. When we passively consume other people's Instagram feeds, we feel bad about ourselves. But what we find is that, that if the path of least resistance is more and more disconnection, which it is, mm -hmm. then what we need to do is just be more intentional about not taking that path, of, of doing these actions that we found work so well for people. So it really is kind of like swimming upstream a little it bit. It is a bit. So, I, I mean, I think that's relieving to a degree, right? Because if it feels hard, there's a reason. It's yeah. not just like, I'm not trying hard enough. Right, right. No, it's not. It's, it's hard. And in fact, you know, when they've done studies of talking to strangers, like mm. on a commute, um, people think they're going to hate it when they're assigned to talk to a stranger. And then they're so much happier than the people who just did their usual thing on their commute. So we find that there's a little bit of resistance to overcome. Yeah. Like maybe this person isn't gonna wanna hear from me. But more often than not, you get so much positive back when you do that little reaching out. Why do you think we feel that resistance? 
Like, aren't we, aren't we a social species? Like, why do we not want to do it? Why does it feel like eating vegetables to talk to somebody on the train? You know, I wonder if it's partly a cultural thing. We were, mm. my wife and I were just in Australia. Okay. And people were different there. People would stop us on the street. If we were looking at a map, they'd say, do, are, do you need any help? It was like, whoa, this is, <laughs> this is not Boston where I live, right? And so I do think there's some cultural factors. You know, is mm -hmm. this person going to think I'm creepy if I, if I make an overture to, to talk to someone I don't know? So yeah. I think there is some of that. Um, I'll tell you one thing I've done. I've started talking to Uber drivers. If an Uber driver, particularly if he or she has an accent, I ask them where they're from. And it has opened up so many wonderful conversations about other countries, about other lives. So I'm just saying you mm -hmm. can, we can cultivate those habits, but it involves uh, pushing against that tide, swimming against it. How much do you blame smartphones for this? Like what percent? <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, there's a researcher named Jean Twenge, who's a psychologist, and she has studied how we use smartphones, how we use social media, and her research finds that if we, if we use them passively to scroll through other people's lives, we, get, we feel worse. But if we actively use smartphones and other social media to connect, mm -hmm. then it enhances well-being. Again, with the texting, I gotta do it. Yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> have any of the studies findings surprised you? Mm. Um, yes, that actually, the, that privilege matters, but it doesn't matter as much for happiness. Mm. That our inner city group and those families, the poor and working class families, um, were just as happy on average. Um, that doesn't mean that deprivation is, is okay, it's not. But what it means is that privilege does not seem to be a ticket to happiness. Mm. Yeah, I think um, another theme in your book about this study, The Good Life, um, is attention, right? So what we're giving our attention to is maybe like the most important thing that shapes our experience of our own lives. Um, so speaking of, you know, the smartphones and whatnot, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of things that compete for our attention. Yeah. Um, is there anything we can do to feel like we are in more control of our attention and directing it to the things that we actually care about instead of having it sucked away and stolen by things that ultimately leave us feeling depleted? Yes, we can be intentional. So literally, they've studied what it's like if you and I have a conversation and there's a smartphone sitting on the table, oh, even, if it's face <laughs> down, even if it's face down, if there's a smartphone on the table, our conversation will go to less depth mm. because there's this subliminal sense that we could be interrupted at any moment. Mm. So I think that the question is, can we be intentional about saying, okay, when we're together, we're, gonna, we're not going to have our phones even visible. Yeah. When we're having a meal together, we are not gonna have phones or iPads there. Yeah, I, I know, I've noticed a norm, at least among my friend group, right, where you put your phone face down, and that's kind of the polite thing, but you're saying that's still too much. Because the message is, we can get interrupted at any moment, so mm -hmm. let's not get too deep. Yeah, that's so interesting. Um, do you think that the factors that contribute to our happiness and and how we spend our attention and all of that shift as we age is the thing that's making me um, the happiest or the thing that's like sucking my happiness different at 16 than it is at you know, 40, 50, 60, 70. Totally, <laughs> totally. I mean, think about you know, what it's like to be 16 and what it's like to be 66 and, and what we care about is so different. Mm -hmm. it, it turns out that as we get older, we get happier that the sense that time is limited, because I used to think, you know, as we got older, we'd get more sad, but as a species, we get happier, that the sense of limited time makes us savor what's going on right now. Mm -hmm. Whereas 16 to 24 year olds are the loneliest age group in our mm -hmm. society. Even though they're trapped in schools with all their peers? I know, and, and we think, yeah, and some of them are in colleges and they're all living together, having their yeah. best lives, right? That's my fantasy, mm -hmm. not true. And so I think one of the things we have to remember is that 
that sense of if we keep pulling back and saying, okay, what's really important in my life, that it makes it ends up making us choose more wisely and it makes us happier. Yeah, it's it's so interesting because I think it's really hard when you are like 16 to 24, right, to imagine yourself that far into the future and what's going to make you happy at that age. And so I, I'm curious in following these people over the course of their lives. Are there any choices that you noticed that people made when they were younger that really did pay off down the line? Or con conversely, things yes. that they should not have done. <laughs> yes, invest, actually investing in relationships. So if you think about it, we studied these delinquent children, boys who were in terrible trouble uh, part, of, part way. And what they found was that the way out of trouble for many of these young men was that they found partners who they cared about, who were good to them, who were sensible. Mm -hmm. And that, that in, in essence, what happens is that investing in good, solid people who take care of each other and are kind turns out to make a huge difference in the courses that our lives take. Sort of regardless of circumstance yeah. or where you start. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so has working on this study changed your personal priorities? Is there anything that you do that you think you might not have done if you didn't take over this study? Definitely. So I'm a Harvard professor. I could work 24-7. That's what we do, right? And I realized that, especially once my kids were out of the house and they weren't dragging me off to do things, I could work all the time mm -hmm. and neglect my friendships. And so my, my research has made me make sure that I call up friends and we go for walks or we go out to dinner. And I don't just leave it to my partner to arrange. I do mm. this with my friends. That's a big change for me. Totally. I think we all have that like one person in our lives who's kind of like brings the spreadsheet energy, yeah. right, to like a trip or they're the one that's always like reaching out. And, <laughs> you know, if maybe you're someone who struggles with that, do you yeah. have any tips? Well, first of all, introverts are perfectly fine having fewer people in their lives. So mm -hmm. that we want to say, right, that, that being an extrovert doesn't necessarily make you happy. Introverts need fewer people. Mm -hmm. So that's not a problem. But then I think you're right that we can <laughs> be with people who, who are better at making these connections and bring us along. My wife is better at that, thank mm -hmm. goodness. Um, I'm really lucky in that regard, but I need to, I've tried to develop more of those muscles on my own because of my research. Totally. I think, um, yeah, my, I had a good friend from college and we always used to joke that like she just made all my friends for me. Yeah. Uh, but then I moved away, so I have to, you know, put in a little bit more work. Uh, <laughs> um, yeah, yeah. I think um, in, in your book, you talk about this concept of um, social fitness, right? Yeah. And it seems like some of these things that you're suggesting, like, you know, send, send in that extra text once a day, it's almost, it just makes me think of like lifting weights, right? Like, so how, how do we get socially swole? Like, that's what right. should our fitness program right. be? That's right. Well, that's what, you know, we, we coined that phrase just because it seemed like a good analogy. You know, mm -hmm. if if you go and lift weights today, you don't go, come home and say, I never have to work out again, right? You don't Maybe do I. that. <laughs> well, hopefully you don't. But, but, you know, if you think about it, like if, if we could do these actions day after day after day, it keeps, us, it keeps those muscles fit. And that's what we found. We found that the people who were so good at this were the people who did it day after day. Mm -hmm. And one of the things you know, we noticed is that those were the people who had the easiest time getting through life's difficulties. And life mm -hmm. brings all of us difficulties. So the, the friendships not only kept us happier, they buffered us from some of the slings and arrows that life is always sending our way. Yeah. Yeah. I think, um, you know, it's, it's, it's all well and good to talk about the habits. And like, I often am like kind of beating myself up for not doing the habits that I know I should. Again, it's just like that feeling that you're kind of swimming against the tide of society when you're trying to, to prioritize these things. And so I, I'm going to ask you to narrow it down. <laughs> um, if all of us with our busy lives could only do one thing and make one habit change, um, what would it be? If we all leave here today and we change one thing? Mm. 
really watch where you're directing your attention and when you can direct it toward the people you care about. Mm -hmm. I mean, that'll do. <laughs> I, <laughs> All right. Cool. Well, thank you so much, Bob. This has been great. Um, I feel like pleasure. I need to go get my phone and send some texts. Yeah. And um, I hope everyone else does too. Yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you. This was fun. Thank you all. Thank you. Here to discuss building the life you want with empathy and courage, please welcome Cheryl Strayed and Arthur C. Brooks, contributing writer at The Atlantic. Hi, Hi everyone. Again, hey. <laughs> Hi, Cheryl. Hi, Arthur. It's so exciting to be here. Look at all the, the iPhones are out. I know, I know. I'm kind they're of not, scared. They're not, they're not texting. They're not, they're, not looking, they're not looking at social media because they're bored, is my guess, and I certainly hope not. Um, I'm looking forward to having this session. I've been looking forward to this for a long time. I've been, I feel like we were destined to connect at some point, given the, the intersections between our work. And, I agree, I and agree. One of, and here's kind of where I want to start this. I mean, everybody knows Cheryl Strayed's work. Um, Wild, which is this incredible memoir about her, is built around a long, long, long walk. But, but what it really was was a pilgrimage toward finding something critically important. If you haven't read it, I urge you to do so. Um, one of the things when you, when you study the serious business of happiness that you learn pretty quickly is that happiness is not a destination. Happiness is a pilgrimage. Happiness is a direction. And, and it makes perfect sense. You don't want to be perfectly happy. You don't want to find ultimate happiness to eradicate your negative feelings. You'd be dead in a week you would not have negative experiences from which you could learn and grow. You need unhappiness. Suffering is incredibly sacred, and Cheryl writes about this incredibly eloquently. But her long walk is a metaphor for what we're all trying to do in life to get happier. I've done this myself. I've walked the Camino de Santiago across northern Spain twice, and I've always found my, what Oprah Winfrey calls my happierness <laughs> along the way. So let's start there. Let's start with the pilgrimage. What did you find as you walked toward Cheryl? Well, I wrote a whole book about it. Yeah. <laughs> it's, it's kind of a long story. And I will say, Arthur, that you're so right. I, I'm so glad to meet you. I'm such a fan of your work. And the, the bell is always ringing um, when I read what you write about the connection between suffering and happiness um, and how much pain and sorrow and loss is, is, you know, threaded into our deepest, most profound joy. And I think that Wild is really all about that. I mean, the, the headline about Wild is, of course, it's about my long hike on the Pacific Crest Trail, which I took in the summer of 1995. Um, but really, what that book is about is how I found my way to continue on in the face of, of enormous suffering and loss. I didn't know how I was going to be able to live without my mother. She had died very suddenly of 45, at 45 of cancer um, when I was a senior in college. As I was becoming a woman, I lost the, the only parent who was you know, the taproot, really, of my life. And what I felt is what I feel like every one of you in this room who's lost somebody essential knows that when you lose somebody essential, the world is over. And I'm not being hyperbolic, that the world, as you know it, is over. And the first thought I had is, I can't go on. I can't live. In the, you know, I can't live. My world is over. What I learned is, no, no, I need to f recreate the world without her, the world without my mother. What is the meaning of the world without my mother? What is the meaning of my life in that world? And how do I thrive without this person who helped me thrive? And so the journey, uh, the pilgrimage, the wild walk I went on was all about learning how to do that, which ultimately was, you know, if people say, what's the one word, what, 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 what's the one lesson, you know, that you learned on that journey? It's the one word is acceptance. And what I mean by that, Arthur, is the acceptance of so much of what you've written about, the acceptance that suffering is part of life, it's part of love, it's part of beauty, it's part of connection, it's part of all of the good things 
So that last line of wild, how wild it was to let it be. Sorry, spoiler alert if you didn't read the book. <laughs> how wild it was to let it be was saying how wild it, it is when we can accept all of it as a gift. Hmm. Hmm. You know, um, if you go back decades um, to the 1960s, sort of the Woodstock generation, there was a, a motto, if it feels good, do it. I remember my dad hearing that for the first time. He's like, that's the end of America, <laughs> right? <laughs> um, he, he might not have been totally wrong. But I know, okay. I know. Yeah. It's like he's, he's kind of right. Anyway, so, um, but now if I look at a lot of 20-somethings today, um, I think that the new Woodstock motto might be, if it feels bad, make it stop. Yeah. If I'm suffering, something's wrong with me. If there is trouble in my life and I'm feeling anxious or depressed, it means I'm broken. What do you say to that, to young people who are feeling these things? Because look, I you read a little Cheryl Strayed, and man, you need to suffer, or you're not going to grow up. You're not going to find yourself. If you don't have unhappiness, you're not going to find happiness. How do you explain this? Yeah, I mean, it's such, a, you're asking these gigantic questions. Both, mm -hmm. both of them so far, I'm like, well, we could talk for years about mm -hmm. this. And both of us have written for years about this because it also, in my work as Dear Sugar, in my book, Tiny Beautiful Things, you know, giving advice to people who write to me saying, essentially, I'm suffering. Um, I also have two teenagers. Um, I have a son who's 19, a daughter who's 17. My son just went to college last week. And my daughter's a senior in high school. And to have two teenagers is always a challenge, it turns out, but to have two teenagers during a pandemic, even more so. And I watched my kids suffer in different ways. I, you know, To protect their privacy, I'm not gonna go deeply into it, but I really had to grapple with this question, like literally in my own household, you know, to find that balance between saying, you know, there, you know, pain does have a purpose. Struggle does have a purpose. The reason it's hard to be a teenager, even if things are going well, is that you're going through, you're evolving. You're going through a deep, profound transformation. And you have to learn some things about yourself and the world and your family. Um, you have to learn some lessons that are painful, that make you struggle. And those are the things that make you grow. Now, also sometimes you have to say, you know, we need to bring in some help. We need interventions. It's always that, I think, not one or the other. You know, I don't think everything should be immediately solved outside the self or with a pill or with a therapy session. One of the things I said, I shared with both of my kids when I would see them struggling and when they would say, go to therapy and then the problem wasn't over, um, was that I don't know a single person in all my life, I've never met a single person who, say, who, who, who recovered, healed, found their way through suffering, who didn't, at core, ultimately save themselves. And so this isn't to say we shouldn't draw on out, outside resources, but it is to say that ultimately we are responsible for our lives, we are responsible for our well-being, and we have to fight for it, we have to struggle for it, we have to walk through the fire to get it. And everyone I know who has gone through that process has done it ultimately themselves. You got to do the work. No that's work. right. You that's right. Have to do work. And that it's within you, you yeah. know, that, that nobody can give you, as you mm. said, you know, happiness. Nobody mm. can give you a sense of well-being. Mm. Um, nobody can, you know, I, this is a quote from Sugar, you know, nobody can take your suffering away. Right. You know. It, one of the exercises that I ask my, my students to do uh, to, to, to undertake over the course of my class and happiness is to understand what their pain means. You know, when you're 28 years old, which is the average age for my students, uh, there's a problem every day. Yeah. There, I mean, somebody is breaking your heart today and you might get a, a C minus on an exam tomorrow and then the job market doesn't look so good the next day. And, and it's, just, it's just a lot, it's just a lot. I ask them to keep a pain journal where it sounds bad, doesn't it? But, <laughs> and, and, but for each entry in the pain journal to leave three lines or to, have, to fill in one line, leave two lines under it. And so you write down you know, whatever it is that's bothering you, which by the way is a very helpful thing to do because that's called metacognition. That moves the experience of the emotion from the limbic system of your brain into the prefrontal cortex where you can manage it. 
mm -hmm. which is a very important thing for us all to do. And journaling is an important way to do that. But to write the thing down and then to leave the two spaces blank under it and come back after one month and on the first open line, right, what did I learn about that pain during the intervening month? And then six months later, come back and say, what good thing happened to me because of that pain? Inevitably, you wind up writing down, writing things in those spaces. And, and after a while, you start, get, you start looking forward to writing in your pain journal because you get to look at the ways that you've learned and grown and benefited. But you have to make it conscious. You have to make it metacognitive. And that's a lot of what you're saying about yeah. how to do the work. This is an example of actually how to do the work, right? Yeah, absolutely. And I think that, so, so just to be clear, like line one would be like, my girlfriend broke up with me or I got right. a D and you know, so, and then you come back. I mean, it is, it's so interesting to me that you're writing about um, that process of metacognition and how powerful it is to do things like journal or write. Because I do think that, you know, as a writer, especially a writer who has written a lot about her life and about her pain. You know, I, I feel like I, I do that actually as part of my work, right. you know, and it is tremendously um, helpful in allowing you to sort of expand beyond um, suffering or anger or any of the things we sometimes feel about the bad things that happen to us or the things we regret, the mistakes we made. Because we then see, like, oh, there, there is a gift. Like, even in the very worst thing. I, I always think it's interesting. I mean, there are different kinds of losses. You, you all remember the first, um, I mean, unless those of you who are still with the first person you fell in love with, um, you know, that first time you had a broken heart. Like, aren't you so glad you're not still with that person? You know? <laughs> I mean, really, it's a pretty universal, like, thank goodness, right? Um, but at the time, you're like, I can't live. My heart is broken. You know, I'm really glad I'm not married to Jeff Boyd. I love Jeff Boyd. You know, glad he's happy. I don't want to be his wife. Um, but you know, I think that that's so. So that kind of pain is pretty easy to see. Like, oh yeah, I learned things, and thank I'm glad that now the death of my mother more complicated. If I could go back in time, I would have my mother <laughs> live. You know, that is not a kind of suffering that I'm like, yeah, I'm so grateful my mom died young, you know, of cancer. Never. But there is something I could write in those lines that Arthur talks about. And, you know, it, I, it, what it is is that my most profound suffering, my most profound suffering has also been my greatest gift. It has informed me as a human, as a writer. It has brought... The things I've written about, my love for my mother, my loss, my grief has brought consolation to, to people around the world. Like that has been a very powerful gift in my life. And for me, again, to see both of the, you know, to see both mm. of those things at the same time, I think is what we need to do. Mm. I mean, that's what your pain journal is about, yeah. right? And you're making another point too. This is incredibly important for us to remember for our own lives, but also as we as we steward and guide other people in our lives. Um, pain is normal. Yeah. A lack of pain is abnormal. You know, I've, I've, like I say to students at Harvard, if you're not anxious and depressed, you need therapy. <laughs> I mean. Well, is anyone at Harvard not anxious? That's the point. I mean, that's don't you point. have to just be anxious yeah, to get into that's Harvard? That's the point. And, 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 and the students, they think they have it bad. You know who's got it bad is the faculty. Holy <laughs> moly. It's, uh, they have no idea. They have no idea what they have no idea what we're going through. But they, I walked across I walked across the Harvard campus once in my life, and yeah. I was instantly anxious. Yeah, instantly anxious. I know. I, know. I was I like, know. they would never let me in this place. Yeah. I know. Yeah. I know. But and so the whole point of that is is helping people understand. Look, you don't have to go looking for pain because you need yeah. the benefits of pain. Pain will find you. But keeping it in proper perspective, that you need a you need to be fully alive. That there was a. a an ancient philosopher and theologian of the fourth century, Catholic saint Irenaeus, who one time said that the glory of God is a person fully alive. He didn't say a person who's like really super happy every single moment of the day. Fully alive. What does it mean to be fully alive? And this is the point that you make in Dear Sugar again and again and again right. and in Wild again and again. You want to be fully alive? Bring it on. That's the whole, that's the gestalt of your work as far as I'm concerned, is you were saying Bring it on. All of it. Right? Yeah. <laughs> it's a gift, but it's also normal in its way. 
But of course, we do want to deal with it in a couple of ways. And the, you know, the title of the session is Building the Life You Want with Empathy and Courage. And these are the two things you've written about really extensively, is the role of empathy and the role of courage, right? Yes, but I have to say, Arthur, you have, you have educated me. <laughs> I just finished listening to your most recent book that you wrote with, what's her name again? Oprah Winfrey? <laughs> um, hey, you know, it's like, I, I, what can I say? I like to give little known authors a chance. <laughs> yeah. That's just how I was raised, you yeah. know? <laughs> Lifting her up. Yeah. And you, you schooled me because you have this whole thing about like empathy versus compassion. Mm. And, you know, I think that, like a lot of people, I use those words interchangeably. interchangeably. Of course. But I, I do, compa I think t most truly by your definition of those words, I do compassion, right. which is I, I, I see your suffering, I feel for you. And here is what I have to say that might illuminate your problem right. or might help you um, down the path further. Right. And very often, I don't remember what your question was there, but well, very often, <laughs> I will. This is good though. <laughs> okay. Very often, I will say, like, I think the deepest compassion is, you know, first of all, telling the truth. Right. I'll very clearly say, uh -huh. you know, here's what, what, what I, you know, here's what I hear you saying. Because I think that so often people do have the answers within them. They're afraid to know their truth. Mm. The, the letters that people write to me very often are like, they say that what they want. They say what they know. They say what they fear. Um, and they're just afraid to wrap their arms around it and say, okay, I can, I can live with this truth. I can live with this fear. I can live with this desire and act upon it. And so I feel like in some ways, my, the most compassionate thing I do as Dear Sugar is show that, you know, shine a light on what they already know and mm. say, I trust you to um, make good on your, the wisdom that's already within you. Mm. Yeah. So just as a a, a basic matter of definitions. What we're talking about here, the difference between compassion and empathy is, and, and social psychologists have written about this a great deal. Empathy is to feel somebody else's pain, different than sympathy. Empathy is to feel somebody else's pain. Compassion is, has an element of empathy, but it builds on empathy. So you feel somebody else's pain, you understand the nature of where it's coming from, you're not paralyzed by it, and you can help the person. That's compassion. It's way better than empathy. I would argue that we, maybe in our society, have too much empathy and not enough compassion. Mm -hmm. I think that we feel other people, and think about it, you know, the worst parents you've ever met are unbelievably empathetic with their teenagers. <laughs> like, that's not what they need. They need you to do hard things. They need you to do things that they don't like sometimes because you actually love them. And if you just feel their pain, there's mm -hmm. a role for that because, you know, you do feel it, but you're not paralyzed by that. And that's, that's an important point that... And that's obviously what you mean in your yeah. writing about empathy. That's, that's actually what you mean. How do you try to live that? So you talk about that in the way that, you, um, that you, your correspondents, your interlocutors. Are, how do you try to live that day to day in your own life? Oh my gosh, I have that same question for you. I, I find <laughs> that, first of all, any kind of writing makes me a better person, mm. but specifically writing Dear Sugar. And of course, the, the collection is, or the many of my columns are collected in the book, Tiny Beautiful Things, but I also still, I have a monthly Substack newsletter. I still do Dear Sugar. Um, and so I'm still engaging with this. And I had a podcast with Steve Allman. So what I found is when I am writing to people about how they might solve their problems or essentially like evolve to that next better version of themselves, it makes me more like it makes me interrogate myself. When I'm talking to somebody about how to make their marriage better, I think, well, like, wait a minute, am I taking my own advice? Mm. And I think that that's really, you know, why writing can be such powerful medicine. Because I, it's not that I, um, you know, I never as Sugar have said like, I'm the wise person who has the perfect impeccable life. Mm. I'm just like you say, listen, I'm the happiness dude who like, I'm not saying I'm happy, you yeah. know? I mean, I'm paraphrasing you. No, no, it's, um, that's <laughs> close enough. And yeah. um, you yeah. know, it's not, I don't give advice. I call it horizontal advice. I'm not coming from this place of like, well, let me tell you what you should do because I know um, and, and I'm perfect. I'm coming from the place of saying, I am engaged in this struggle that it is to be, you know, how to be not only human, but a human who is always growing and evolving and trying to, to find that, you know, deeper meaning, more, 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 a more compassionate way of living, um, a more, a, a way in which I struggle less and I'm comfortable more, though, of course, I'm also saying, and then, and then also welcome the struggle. Every new age brings a new struggle. 
Um, so I give advice from that vantage point point of mm -hmm. saying like, I'm down in there with you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's interesting that a lot of people would say, um, maybe intuitively, if you haven't mastered something, you can't, you can't teach it, but that's actually quite wrong. And we know that actually from the social uh -huh. science literature, the best language teachers are, are usually second, uh, the speakers of second languages. Um, and as a matter of fact, you can teach a language really effectively before you've mastered that language because you're actually learning it in real time. Uh -huh. and that's what makes you really good at it. My wife is an immigrant and she started her first words of English for when she was 25 years old. Wow. She, we moved to, we married in Spain. We lived in Spain for a long time. We moved to the States in our late 20s and her English was really flawed. And her first job was an English teacher. <laughs> and, and, and my wife said, don't you people have standards in this country? <laughs> <laughs> and I said, I no. It. I said, she was, she was working in, um, in an environment where she was teaching uh, immigrant kids who were from very marginalized economic communities. And they needed somebody who understood what it was like to learn English when English was hard, is yeah. the whole point. And so that, that's the same principle for happiness, isn't it? That's the yeah. same principle for, for trying to live a a better life is that when you're working on it, you're consciously aware of the challenges that other people are having. You know, those naturally happy people that I hate, they, it's not a struggle. So how would they know is what it comes down to. And that's yeah. a lot of what you're getting at, right? And are there any, like, I mean, I think that even what you call naturally happy people, I also, I took this, is it Panos test in your book? Panos, yeah, the Panos. positive affect, and negative I'm, affect series. I hate to tell you, what I'm like you? really solidly and definitively a cheerleader. Uh -huh. um, you know, a high personal, we'll explain this high in a second, positive folks, yeah. affect, yeah. very low negative affect. And But even as, a, as somebody who has a natural inclination, I think towards yeah. that kind of, um, I guess what you'd call happiness, this doesn't mean, I mean, as you know, the, I mean, even happy people struggle. You can't be alive and not struggle. Right. You can't be alive and not have loss and grief and hardship and challenges, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. and quest deep questions that are, that are you know, mm. that involve some suffering to answer. Right. You know, life, uh, life on earth in involves a lot, of, a lot of emotions, which are not good or bad. They're just information. Yeah. That's all emotions are is information about the outside world and, and, and giving you information about how you can react to the outside world. It's very important to understand emotions in this way, but some people in, experience their emotions more intensely than others. And what we're talking about here is a test um, that, that we put in the book. And it's a, it's a test you can take on yourself to find out what your own personality profile is in the intensity of your positive and negative emotions. It's called a PANAS test. You can go to the website for the book at arthurbrooks.com. We link to it there and you can take it and you can find out who you are. And there's four kinds of people out there. Intense positive and intense negative emotions. That's the mad scientist. That's a quarter of the population. I'm a super mad scientist. Super, it's like, it's, it's impossible to be married to me. Impossible, my wife says. So <laughs> there's intensely positive and weakly negative, naturally weakly negative. That's Cheryl. Cheerleader. Yeah, that's the cheerleader. I was actually also a, a literal cheerleader in high school, just yeah. so you know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, <laughs> and that's, and that's, and, and I found every, my calling young, yeah, you yes. know. <laughs> Everybody wants to be that, but the point is not that bad things don't happen to you. The point is that you're, you're better at, pro, you're more efficient at processing intense positive emotions than negative emotions, so you have natural strengths. Everybody wants to hang out with cheerleaders. They also have weaknesses, by the way. They're quite, they're naturally deficient at giving bad news or hearing Simmer negative down information. Simmer over there. <laughs> see, 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 this is my point. See. And, and, and they shouldn't marry each other, by the way, because when two cheerleaders marry each other and they block out all threats and bad news, they generally run up their credit cards and go bankrupt. <laughs> My husband and I came pretty close before yeah. Wild was published. Yeah, really? okay. yeah. <laughs> Interesting. It's like, the solution is write a big bestseller. So the, <laughs> no, no. I, don't think he, I don't think he's a cheerleader. Yeah, you're right. Yeah, news you can use, folks. Anyway, so <laughs> if you have intensely negative and, 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 and weakly positive emotions, that's the poet. That's the poet temperament. That's a quarter of the population. Might sound awful, but those people tend to be creative, romantic, melancholic, and if they manage that particular temperament, it can be very, very beautiful. And then those who have low affect, low positive and low negative, it doesn't mean they don't feel things. It means that their, their affect levels are low intensity. These are the judges. They're unflappable. They're sober. That's what you want if you're a surgeon. 
for example. I don't want somebody to cut me open and say, oh my God. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, so, so you can take this test and you'll learn a lot about yourself. And one of the things, so this is, this is kind of what we're talking about here. And it's important to understand who you are such that you can exploit your natural strengths and also you can surround yourself with people who complement you, people who strengthen you, people who fill in your gaps, as it were. Have you done that in your life? Have I found yeah, people have you who... found people who actually complete you in this oh, way? I mean, absolutely. I know you have. I I'm mean, just, in I'm a different. Books, so my but, husband, yeah. who I've been with now for 28 years, um, I met him nine days after I finished my hike on the Pacific Crest Trail. Um, I literally like did a pilgrimage, found myself, and then found this incredibly hot dude who I'm still married to. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So he compliments, I mean, he, he I am like an, an extrovert. I don't know if you guys have noticed. Um, and he's, you know, much more quiet. Yeah. He's like a, he's a calmer, quieter, introverted person. And, but we're both, see, I call myself an extroverted hermit because I love to do this kind of stuff when I'm at ease talking, but I actually really love to be alone. So it's like I, and so does my husband. So we know mm. how to be alone with each other together. We, but we both are like solitaries in some ways. Like he's, he's a filmmaker. I'm a writer. Like we, we, so we complement each other, but we're also ex incredibly different. You mm. know, if you were at dinner with us, you'd be like, yeah, Brian, everyone's always like, Brian is such a great guy. You know, you're so lucky. I'm like, hello. <laughs> Nobody ever says to Brian, I don't understand this. But um, yeah, I, I, you know, because he's kind of like just very calm and reassuring yeah. to people. Yeah, those, and there's a lot of data on that, that introverts and extroverts make great couples yeah. together. They really do. But they have to see their differences as a source of strength as opposed to a source of weakness, which is a decision that we can all make. Another uh, distinction that's important to make, given the fact that this session is building the life you want with empathy and courage, is the definition of courage. Now, if empathy isn't compassion, Courage is not fearlessness. Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that that is, you know, uh, there, a lot of these things we talk about, um, we, you know, we throw these words around like courage and we think like, okay, there's a class of people who just are the brave people, you know? They're the brave people who have the capacity to do things, whether it be public speaking or jumping off the side of a mountain or fill in the blank, whatever it is that we decide is a brave thing to do. And what, uh, you know, what I always, try to say to people who write to me or I write about it in my own books is that that courage, you know, we all have the capacity to, to be brave in our own lives. And it isn't something that you either have or you don't. It's something you cultivate, you know, within you. And the way you cultivate it is you start doing things. You start doing things that scare you, whether it be literally sometimes to say one sentence, you know, speak one sentence of truth about who you are or what you know or what you want, or what you're afraid of, you know, admitting to, to, to a vulnerability or a fear. And the minute that somebody, I, I, lo I love to witness this when I teach uh, writing workshops sometimes, you know, I, I mean, if, if we lock the doors right now and I made you all take out a piece of paper and write, you know, the, the, the hardest thing in your life or the thing you're the most ashamed of or the thing, you know, the scariest thing, and then we went around the circle and read them out loud, most of you would be p terrified to do it. But... I promise not to make us do that today, but sign up for one of my workshops if that sounds like fun to you, okay? <laughs> and what immediately happens is when that first person just says that first sentence, that's a scary sentence, it, 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 it changes the atmosphere in the room, and it and eventually changes your life when you learn how to do that. You know, sometimes courage is an action, sometimes it's a, it's a, a, a statement, Sometimes it's simply a, a way of conducting oneself in your life, you know, being brave enough to do something differently, you know, to say no, to say yes. And, and so I, I really think that that cultivation of courage, you know, is, is, is something that belongs to all of us. What do you say about courage? Well, there are, courage obviously is, is, is not fearlessness because it's pathological to not feel fear. We must feel fear. There, we have an amygdala in our brains to process fear for a reason. And that's, it's, been, it's evolved to keep us alive. I mean, it's, this is no joke. You need, if there's a saber-toothed tiger behind you, you need to feel fear and run. You yeah. need to pump out some stress hormones under the circumstances. The problem is when it becomes pathological. 
it's pathological to not feel it, but it can be maladapted. You know, you want to be afraid of being cast out of your tribe and walking the frozen tundra and dying alone. But you shouldn't feel the same thing because of Twitter. <laughs> but we do, is the whole point. And so the result of that is that we need to actually face our fears, which you did on the Pacific Coast Trail. Yeah. That's the whole point. Uh, you actually found your courage by facing your fear. Absolutely. Like, you know, one of the, the lines in Wild is, you know, fear is a story we tell ourselves. And I decided to tell myself a different story in deciding to take that hike. Mm. And, and it was actually a conscious decision. So when I first thought, you know, I'm going to go walk alone on this trail. First of all, I knew right away, okay, just, just to decide that I'm breaking certain rules, right? Don't walk alone in the wilderness. Don't walk alone if you're a woman. Okay, two codes that we've all heard, right? I knew I was going to do this. And the reason I knew I was going to do it is that I was like, okay, this does seem kind of scary to me, but the decision I'm making is fear going to be my ruler or not. And I do think that really thinking of it like that, to say fear is present. Fear, fear has a place in this decision and this picture and this experience, but it's not going to be the thing that, that rules my decision. And so I decided long before I set foot on the trail that I wouldn't be afraid. I adopted a mantra that, I, that every time I felt afraid, I would say to myself, I'm not afraid. I'm not afraid. I would say it out loud to myself. And what's the paradox of that, of course, is the only time I said I am not afraid is when I was afraid. Okay? So I am not afraid. What that meant is, hello, fear. I see you. You're right there. And I'm not going to let you... Over, overtake me. My life isn't going to be guided by you. It's, it's going to, I'm going to, you're going to be my escort. This happens too when I write. You know, I have a terrible, uh, I, you know, monster in my head, like most writers do, that's just like, you're stupid, nobody cares, what are you doing? Why don't you just go, you know, do something else? And I'm just like, welcome, sit down, get out of the way, I'm going to do my work. And I think that fear has, been, that's how I've that's how I have cultivated mm. courage. It's just saying, is fear going to rule this? Now, if a tiger were chasing me, fear would be my ruler, and I would run. Mm. But, but you do have to discern, like, what is, a, what is an accurate mm. fear? Mm. And say, like, okay, let's listen to that, and what isn't? Right. Fear has evolved to keep you alive. The problem that we have in modern life is that we're so bombarded by small sources of social fear and comparison that we develop anxiety, and anxiety is nothing more than unfocused fear. Figuring out what the focus actually should be yeah. makes it metacognitive to the point that we can manage it in an appropriate way and we can get on with our lives. Absolutely. Um, before we finish, I, you know, you're so incredibly quotable that I was thinking, um, <laughs> I want to read a couple of quotes and have you react to them for the audience, partly because I just want to have an excuse to, to quote some of your incredibly eloquent words to the audience, but also just to get a little commentary on that. Is it okay, okay. if I do that? Okay, so you're going to read my quotes yeah, to me. Yeah, yeah, and then I'm, I'm going gonna... to read your words to you. And this is like, yeah. And then <laughs> and, no pressure. I, I don't have to come up with like an even better quote. No, no, yeah, that's right. This is, the, this is the best, okay. you know. And, and usually when people do this in Washington, D.C., they're trying to embarrass you, but that's not what we're, um, it's like, it's like, is it not true that you said, no, the. Um, <laughs> I'm scared, I'm scared. <laughs> that's right. Quote. Don't surrender your joy for an idea you used to have about yourself. That's no longer true, right? Yeah. It's really heavy, but there's so much in that. Can you unwrap that just a little yeah, bit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, it's interesting, you know, I, actually, uh, the, the, the Dear Sugar letter I'm writing right now that I'm going to publish, like, in a couple of days, I'm answering a letter from a woman who's like, I, live, I moved to New York City at 19, small town girl, um, you know, I fiercely wanted to make it, make myself, you know, make it myself a name for myself in New York. Ten years later, I'm 29. I think I want to leave New York, but you know, I'm. And she's terrified of like, well, does this mean I have given up? Does this mean I didn't succeed? Does this mean now I'm going to miss my opportunity? I'm going to leave just before the real opportunity in New York comes. This is a classic example of something that a lot of us get stuck in. It's like she had this old idea about herself in New York City ten years ago. A decade later, she feels like a failure because like that, that idea didn't come true or, now, or her idea of herself has changed. She wants something different now. And so what is more powerful, to 
to surrender her joy so she can stick to her guns and stay in New York and do what she had planned to do 10 years ago? Or is it to say, hey, I'm evolving. I'm going to rewrite my life. I'm going to rewrite the story of myself. I'm going to do something new and different. And what that means is I'm not going to surrender my joy. I'm going to surrender the old story. You know, I think so much of our journey in the direction of happiness is about always saying, let's, let's rewrite this. You know, sometimes it means ending a relationship, leaving a job, um, you know, leaving a city. Sometimes it means like in a marriage saying, okay, that's who we were 10 years ago. Let's reawaken. Who are we now? My husband and I are about to be empty nesters soon. It's like, what's next for us, you know? And I think that that, you know, to stay awake to your life is never about surrendering, surrendering joy at the service of an idea. It's always about having that next idea and building a new story around that. Mm. You write beautifully about not being held to a vision that you once had of yourself, which of course is a form of self-objectification. Mm -hmm. We all know that it's, it's, it's a grave ill to objectify other people for their looks or for their money or whatever, but we objectify ourselves all the time. Who am I? Yeah. Writer, whatever. I mean, my job, my, I self-objectify myself. I'm a human person. I'm not my job. I'm not my opinions. I'm not my past. And only when we can let go of the things that aren't us can we actually be ourselves. Yeah. Really, for sure. Everyone who comes to you already knows the answer. Is that true? It's almost true. I mean, there are some people who just very profoundly get <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, when you dig in, like, again, when I teach writing very often, if I'm reading somebody's manuscript, um, and it can be a page long or it can be a whole novel, one thing I'll say is circle the sentence in what you've written that means the most to you? What is the one sentence in this whole work that means the most to you? Very often, like, that's the truth. And, and sometimes that means all the other sentences have to go. And that sentence that you've written, that's the place where you begin. And I do think that, that obviously we all, like, I listen to your book, and even though, like, I'm like, oh, yes, 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 there's so much. I learn about it. Things I already know are reaffirmed. But, you know, there's always, it's always like, I think that the thing that's most powerful is like, I know this stuff and you're articulating mm. it in a powerful way in your voice that deepens my understanding mm. of it. And I do think that that's what people do when like write Dear Sugar a letter. It's like they are presenting to me a problem that, that has the answer imbued in it. Mm. And they might just need my help to say like, let's look at that. Like you said you are miserable mm. in New York City. So of course you have to go, done, next letter, you know? <laughs> and. I mean, I've just written the next column right here on stage, you know. Of course, I'll say all this other stuff, but that's the core truth, mm. you know. That is the core truth. Mm. And so I do believe that, yeah. Mm. You know, there's uh, the, the, big, the big philosophical difference between the f artistic approaches, typically in the West and in the East, is we have a concept of a work of art yet to be started as an empty canvas to be filled up with brush strokes. Whereas in the East, they'll often talk about the sculpture which exists inside the block of jade before the chisel comes out. And it seems to me that this is a lot of what you're doing is telling people to get out the chisel so they can find what's already in there. That's the point, isn't it? Absolutely. And yeah. we're all encased in the sort of the detritus of all the things that aren't true, but the truth is actually in there. And it's time to stop adding more to our lives and start taking things away which is what you did on the Pacific Coast Trail. Yeah. You took out, that was the chisel, right? There was, there was um, sleeping, eating, drinking, walking, silence, sunsets, sunrise, sunsets, sunrise. I Do mean, it again. The, simpl the radical simplicity yeah. of just, and everything I needed, that was, that's something that never, ever left me, Yeah. is that everything I needed to live was on my back. I carried it in that backpack. And to bring life down to that level of simplicity for, you know, an extended period like I did was really a profound, you know, I, of course, I now have like way more junk, you know, but I remember the truth mm. of that. Mm -hmm. I carry the truth of that. Mm -hmm. um, this is why I'm such an advocate of like, you know, take journeys, like actually go on journeys that take you outside your comfort zone, that take you outside mm -hmm. of the ordinary, that bring you back to simplicity. I mean, it would be fun to check into the Four Seasons in Paris for three months, but it's probably not going to be very good for you. Um, walking, a 
long way and you know with everything you need on your back will change your life hmm. what are you working on right now i'm working on my next book which i've been working on for some time and um, also, you know, I've, in the last few years, been kind of writing in Hollywood. I've been writing scripts and screenplays and so forth. And um, I was a writer on the Tiny Beautiful Things. My, my Dear Sugar book was adapted into a Hulu TV show. I was a writer and executive producer on that. I wrote, I was hired to write a screenplay about Janis Joplin, which I did during the pandemic, went deep into her life. Mm. It was very interesting. And now I'm working, now that the strike is over, I'm back to work on another script. So I kind of do both script writing mm. and book writing and my monthly column. And I'm also working on um, changing my life. And I, and I know that sounds funny or dumb, but it's true. I turned 55 a couple weeks ago and my kids are getting older and every, you know, I feel my life shifting in this way that it shifted kind of in my 20s when I went on my hike. And I'm really thinking deeply about how to move into this next era of my life mm. um, and making some changes in my personal, like just in my, like, you know, doing planks more, yeah, things like that. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's what it boils down to, yeah. doing, doing planks. Well, it's, it's good to know that the author of Wild, the memoir, is still on a pilgrimage. That's and right. And we'll enjoy it along with you. Please join me in thanking Cheryl Stray. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, guys. Thank you. Here to discuss Remember Love, words for tender times, please welcome Clea Wade, author and poet, with Megan Garber, staff writer of The Atlantic. Hi, everyone. And hi, Cleo, thank you for being here. Thank you We're for so having for this me. Conversation. Yeah. So we don't have very much time, so I'm just gonna get right into my questions, if you don't mind. Yeah. I wanted to start broadly with the title of the book itself, and especially the subtitle of the book, uh, Words for Tender Times. And tender, I think, is such a good word. Yeah. It's just, it's so powerful, it's so resonant, I think especially right now, yeah. um, when so many people are, are sort of negotiating the double valence of that word. Um, you have on the one hand softness and empathy, I think is implied in that word, and um, community in some ways. And then on the other hand, you have ache and you have wound and you have the openness to even more wound. Mm -hmm. And I think that's such a resonant idea in the book and in the poems as well. And I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about that, the sort of tension between, I guess, the soft places and the hard ones. Well, so much of my work is informed by my friendships, mm. um, especially with the women in my life. And so mm. um, when I was writing Remember Love, I had a friend staying with me from New Orleans, mm -hmm. Devana, mm -hmm. and uh, she was going through a tough time and she was on the phone with another friend. And I don't know why, because I was in the middle of writing, so I actually don't know why she was in the room on the phone, <laughs> like pacing behind me, but she was. And I heard um, our mutual friend say to her, you know, as she was kind of tearfully expressing what she was going through. And she said, just remember we're living in tender times. Mm -hmm. And that so deeply yeah. impacted me because we are. And it's not just about our tender lives. It's about this tender time. And I think that we really are in this deep, deep space of recovery from the past few years. Um, and I mean that with not only being indoors for years, but <laughs> politically what we've gone through for years, having this like, kind of constant stream of like GoFundMes and <laughs> tragedies and beauty and catastrophe and our, the palm of our hands, morning, noon, and night. And it's, yeah. it's a very, very tender space for us to be adapting to right now. Yeah. And so for me, when I wrote this book, I kind of approached it the same way I've written my other books, which, which is that I always want to try to create something that can be a friend mm. in a time of need. And so I think about, you know, when you are, um, if you are so lucky to be going through the hard thing and have a living room full of friends who are all there holding you during the hard thing, but, you know, one by one they leave and then you change into your pajamas and you <laughs> kind of get in the bed and it's just you. And 
Um, we all know what it feels like to have that one book that felt like it was just there for you and you could turn to it and you could go to it over and over again um, because it, it was kind of there to be there for you. Mm, um, not yeah. necessarily to distract you, but to hold you. And uh, so for me, it's, I think in that most alone feeling where we are feeling our most tender, especially in the current circumstances of our world, I wanted to create a just, the, I don't know, a helping hand or a hug or if you will yeah. for that. It really does have the feeling of a hug, it really does. And I wonder along those lines, you talk a bit about being a friend to yourself. Yeah. And I think that idea is so powerful and something that we're not always encouraged to do. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that as well. Well, we're mean to ourselves, Yeah. you know? Yeah. Like, no one is meaner to you than yourself. No one is more embarrassed by you. Um, no one is like over criticizing you more or telling you you look bad or yeah. good or whatever it is. And yeah. so I think um, if we can really achieve kindness towards ourselves, at the very least, you know, maybe it takes you your whole life to become your own friend. And, and, that's, a, and that's a relationship worth <laughs> trying to have, yeah. um, but I think at the very least, self-kindness when you are struggling or going through a hard time um, is, I think, critical. It's critical to being able to find okayness when you don't feel okay. It's critical to knowing how to bring the right people around you when you're not yeah. feeling okay. Yeah. Um, and so that kind of fundamental, um, you know, kind thought about yourself or, um, you know, way to kind of I think combat negativity within, I think is, is, is important. Yeah, and how do you, for yourself, how do you encourage yourself to find the kindness? Because I know it, it can be so hard to, to sort of silence the negativity and, and be a friend to yourself in the way that you deserve. How do you, how do you go about that? You know, I think anything else just doesn't feel like a good idea. Yeah. I mean, it feels yeah. practical. I mean, it yeah. feels like the most kind of obvious practical way to be kind to your to, to 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 do something good for yourself is to say like you know what I could choose the nice thought I I didn't I was not and I cannot be in control of everything I mm, think yeah. but I can often choose the next thought yeah so I can oh, think yeah. that I can think I did a bad job but I can say the next thought can be well you know I did learn from probably saying the wrong thing or wishing I would have done better and I can observe that and and um, I can give myself love in that moment. And I think for me, even when I wrote the, um, this book, and, and this was the first thing I'd ever written where I had the title before I'd written the book because hmm. I, was, um, I was kind of at the height of my postpartum depression with my first kid, I think. Um, and I'm having this moment where I'm, I don't know if any of you have struggled with postpartum depression or depression of any kind, but, um, you know, you start to do the things that you're so sure just the right thing to do for yourself. So you're like, okay, what is just like quintessentially helpful? Like mm. a bath, <laughs> you know, like mm -hmm. a yeah. walk. You're, so you just try to do the, start with the kind of fake it till you make it yeah. things that make you feel better. So yeah. I'm in the bath and <laughs> I put on a Tara Brock podcast. <laughs> uh, and uh, I'm kind of paying attention. I'm kind of not, I'm, I'm you know, you're in this kind of, brain fog, and in some sentence I hear her say, remember love, and it just hit me in such a profound way um, because it was the reminder that I had the power to be nice to myself during a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. Like, could I just remember to just be loving towards myself? Could I remember love in my next thought to myself? Could mm -hmm. I remember love in, in, in how I planned my day the next day, and instead of, you know, feeling bad about myself because I didn't have the efficiency I thought I could have or I couldn't get the work done the way I thought I could or I couldn't be there for others in my life the way I could instead of being cruel to myself um, because I was struggling um, I remembered love uh, hmm. and I you know remembered love and how I approached every way I treated myself and then I kind of started to I, I remember I took it and I wrote it on a post-it note I wrote, please remember love, because I was being polite and nice to myself. So I wrote, please remember love, and I put it at the top of a push board, a pin board, and um, I then just started 
adding post-its around what I thought, mm. everything that helped me. Um, and every way that I, if I talked about it with my girlfriends and I kind of saw for three years my life through this veil of remembering love. So mm. when I listened to my friend, when she came over to tell me she was getting divorced or when I sat there holding my friend's hand as her daughter went to college or whatever my friends were going through, um, it was kind of all seen through this. And so I started kind of writing it out and planning it out. and. Mm turned into this book. Oh, that's amazing. That's amazing. And I, one of my favorite lines um, is actually uh, pivoting from the previous conversation, uh, which is, we do not get to stay who we were. I just, I love that idea. And I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, about sort of, I, I think a lot of people can relate to the idea of the person who you were holding back, the person who you are, the person who you want to be. And I think that's, that's such a resonant idea in the book. Well, we get lost over and over and over again, and every time you refind yourself, you're new. Yeah. Um, and it's and there's this one page, and I think there's six words on the page of the book, and it says, and the title of the poem is "It's Simple," and um, it says, uh, "It's simple. Every time you change, you get to know yourself again." Mm. And and it is, you know, we don't get to stay the same. Life is changing us. You know, my best friend's father passed away in the middle of the night last night and she is going to be a completely different person right. um, yeah. forever. And she doesn't get to stay the same. Yeah. So it's, it is, it's, it's a simple and tough and tender truth. And yeah. I think, you know, and something I love so much about Cheryl is that her starting place is always with honesty because, you know, you can't heal the right thing if you're not honest about what's happening. Yeah. And so for me, especially with this book, it was about talking about the honest thing so we could start healing the, the thing we need to heal and the thing that we need help with. And sometimes it's just time. Um, do you know, I was just saying to someone, I was like, you know, you can't hack heartbreak. And in this culture hmm. where like everything online is telling us three ways to do this and three ways for healthy <laughs> self-esteem and four ways to do this and this, if you just do these 10 things and you're like, no, you need time. Yeah. You can't hack everything. Yeah. And it's and, and you need time and you need kind words and you need comfort and you need poetry and you need art and you need your favorite writers to talk in front of you and help <laughs> you through and and that that is actually the um, the help that is helpful the helping hand that yeah. you know kind of will hold you up. Yeah. Oh, I love that. And relatedly, um, you mentioned in the book people have different times, different timelines, and that's something that I think a lot of us don't often respect because you said before efficiency that's such an mm. ethic in our culture and um i think it's just it's it's so kind mm. to remember that everyone has their different timelines and to not put each other on the same one yeah i mean i think we live in this kind of hustle and grind and even like the word grind is so oh. like <laughs> you just think about yourself turning to <laughs> dust and why <laughs> like and so i think you know when when we sit there and we we put our lives on anyone else's timeline or in anyone else's way. Um, it's so funny because I was talking to someone on the street last night and she was saying that um, I, when the last time I was in DC, I was doing a tour with my friends um, and I always bring my girlfriends on tour with me. Um, mm -hmm. And I was in conversation and she was saying that, you know, an idea that you, that I spoke about was that I only work with my friends. I, I don't believe in the kind of idea mm -hmm. that oh, never work with your friends. I actually only want to work with my friends. Um, but that's also because for me, I don't, I don't think about how the world is working and then try to work with the world because the world does not see individually who I am or what I've gone through. Only I know that and the people that I create bonds and relationships with. So this idea that we are, you know, deciding that we are always running a race and never taking a walk and always competing and never holding a hand, um, is, is I think a culture that I feel really happy that most people are trying to turn their backs to so that they can get more near to the people that are gonna love and hold them back. Yeah. But the standards of the world are not gonna hold you close and they're not gonna love you. They don't love you. Right, yeah, that's true. That's very the opposite in a yeah. lot of ways, yeah. And a related idea is the power, I think, of vulnerability. So often, I think the world does say vulnerability is weakness. Vulnerability mm -hmm. is um, something that you shouldn't express, certainly, let alone feel. Mm -hmm. um, and so much of the book, I think, is a, is a counter to that. Mm -hmm. um, and I, I wonder if you could just talk a little bit about the, the power of vulnerability. Well, it's really funny because 
Cheryl over here. <laughs> so Cheryl and I are dear friends, and so <laughs> I'm talking to her kind of right before this book goes to print. And I, let me tell you something. Self-care, tough <laughs> word. Vulnerability, tough word. Shame, tough word. What do these words mean at this point? Yeah. They are so overused by so many people in so many different spaces, and you're like, what even is that? Yep. Do you know, like people do self-care and they hate every single thing about it. They're like, <laughs> I did the yoga, I had the green juice, I did it, and you're like, I don't, like we don't know, it's really confusing. <laughs> yeah. Vulnerability, I never use that word because I'm always like, I think that everyone else in the room has a different definition. Um, does it mean that you were just able to cry in front of someone? Yeah. I don't know. Um, because some people are really good at crying and other people aren't. And mm -hmm. anyway, I'm talking to Cheryl and I ask her, she says the word vulnerable to me in the conversation. And um, I said to her, I was like, can you just define that for me? Because I don't feel that I understand what that means. Yeah. Uh, and, or, or I certainly don't have a shared definition of that in, in, in community with people. And she said, vulnerability is when you are, um, being honest about who you are and what you're going through. And it impacted me so deeply that I pull my book from the press, I take two <laughs> pages out, I write about that definition in this book and I put the book back on, you know, I send the book back to the printers. It is because this idea that, especially in a world that is so deeply performative, um, online, in real life, and you talked about that too, Cheryl, you said, um, cause I said, do you think it just like, the internet has made the world so performative that nothing and no one feels real anymore. And she goes, well, I don't know. Like, don't you think people are performative at a party too? <laughs> like there's always the person that's kind of like posing. <laughs> and then she said, then there's always the person who's gonna be in the corner honestly telling you about why their marriage is ending. Mm -hmm. And she's like, I don't know about you, but I'm gonna pick the person in the corner every time. Yeah. And so I think, mm -hmm. you know, for me, I didn't even realize that this was the most vulnerable book I'd ever written um, until luckily I had that conversation. And so, so much of vulnerability to me is, is, is honesty, is starting with honestly, who are you and what are you going through? Um, and I think that's the perfect starting place for making a friend, for rebuilding a bond, for connecting to your family, to connecting to a stranger, to being with anyone. Yeah, oh, I love that. And I wonder too about um, the way that our kind of optimism bias relates to that. Um, you know, if someone, if I were having basically one of the worst days of my life and someone were to ask me, how are you? I would reflexively say, oh, I'm fine. Yeah. I just would. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder, and, and that is the opposite of vulnerability. That's the opposite mm -hmm. of honesty. Um, and yet I think it's so ingrained that I just can't escape it. I, yeah, and how, it's also <laughs> hard because we have to take responsibility for ourselves, right? So like you can't trauma dump and trauma bond right, with everybody. Right. So <laughs> that's also hard. You know, what is the line of like, I am responsible for my energy and I can be honest about what's going on. Yeah. And, and, and I don't, you know, I don't put on, because that doesn't build community either, right? And that's what we need the most. Community is what keeps us safe. So the, you know, we do have to have kind of walk that line of, did I, you know, freak everybody out? Not because I was honest, but because um, I didn't consider them in their life and how I shared. And that's yeah. important. Yeah. And so I do think that, you know, I, I think even, um, Earlier when we were talking, I was telling you about my friend's father and you're like, I'm so sorry. And of course the impulse is to say, it's okay. Right. And you do have to pause because it's not okay. You know, and so you say, thank you. Um, or you say, yeah, it's really hard. But, and so I think that there's ways to, but I'm, but I'm not going to, you know, go into the details. Right. Right. So I think there's ways to kind of find um, a way to be real mm -hmm. um, and a way to, you know, like not have to have self-betrayal in order to connect with another or be fake, um, while also being responsible and, you know, remembering that we are all in a community going through things. Right. Uh, and so, but I think we don't have to be in a good mood all the time and we don't have to be happy all the time and we don't have to be okay. And if you're not okay, the first step in trying to become okay again is to probably say that. Yeah, right, right. And I think it relatedly to that idea of awkwardness, you know, I'm going to make it awkward yeah. if I, but life if is I'm awkward. honest. Right, exactly. Life is awkward. So you're just like, affirming reality. <laughs> right, exactly. <laughs> Let's all be awkward. I yeah. think that's, yeah, that's perfect. <laughs> I'm like, I'm doing it right now. <laughs> yeah, me too. It's great. <laughs> 
<laughs> um, so one of one of my favorite words in the book is um, is ease and easeful. Yeah. And I wonder if you could talk about how those those words and the idea of ease um, was was present for you as you were writing. Well, I think kind of going back to I think you know leaning out of this culture of hustle and grind and creating not you know, I was not like a culture of ease in the sense of like the great resignation. You know, we're not, it's a, it's not a, it, you were in the real world, you have to go to work. Like you have to have a job, get a job. Do you know what I mean? But we <laughs> can also, you know, allow for us ourselves to want freedom. Yeah. And this idea that like everything and every, every way that we understand ourselves is not through some way in which we are productive to be able to be the being of human being and not only be these kind of chronic doers right. because there is really no, there's no rainbow and no pot at the end of that rainbow. <laughs> right. So, but I right. do think that if we orient towards ease, in ease we can find deeper connections with ourselves and those we love. Yeah. And so it's actually about right. saying, well, yes, of course I work and I, I take care of people and I take care of myself, but for what? Yeah. You know, for do I, do I, do I, work and create and do um, for my own freedom and for the freedom of others, you know, or am I working and doing only to do and I actually don't know how to consider myself as anything other than a utility or a function. You know, there's a there's a poem in, in, in the Remember Love that says, um, it's bad when you butcher your own work, but it says something like, uh, you call yourself the glue, but while you hold it all together, who is holding you? And I write about this idea of like how I was proud my entire life to be the glue, yeah. you know, but what is the glue? It's this like gunky, tacky <laughs> substance that is doing for others and that isn't the thing that gets to be um, at the center of the family or, or at, the, at the center of love because it's functioning for other people to, to be held and to be able to be. And this idea that could I ever really know myself if I was never being able to be myself, if I was just something that was doing all the time. And so I remember when uh, something I wrote about was how I had um, kind of, not like writer's block, but when I, you know, a few years ago during my postpartum, but I was like, gosh, it's just so hard to, I always think of like, if I can't write, I just listen or I'll read. Um, and then Nikki Giovanni had this writing advice that was like, you know, the, if you wanna write, you have to, the first thing you have to do is relax. Mm. And I mean, I'm sure this is at the height of COVID. So I was like, relax. I didn't even know there was an option, right. you know? And so I, all of a sudden, I didn't even realize that even though I'd had, I was even ambitious about things like caring for myself or, um, you know, whether it was like reading every self-help book or, you know, going to every talk or doing all these things where I was even doing um, even the good stuff for myself, but I was always doing. And I didn't even realize that relaxation was on the table or so incredibly necessary to self-kindness um, and to um, even connecting more deeply to those I love. Yeah. And so for me, I think this kind of, um, I call it kind of like the, the great repacing that we need, which is to remember that, you know, the, the, the pace of the world does not have to be your pace. Yeah. And in that, you know, how do we gear towards ease towards freedom, to have a, a day in which we do whatever we feel we need to do as something that just is. Yeah, um, yeah. Oh, I love that, yeah. And um, even though the, the, the word, I think, has been um, commercialized, you know, kind of seeded to the market in some ways, self-care really is so important. And But I, I wanted to ask about what seems to me to be kind of the countervailing idea, which is just, you know, where is the line between sort of caring for yourself and selfishness, you know? Where, how do you think about this sort of tension between being a friend to yourself and being a friend to other people? Well, you know, it's interesting because I think all of, I mean, a lot of these words entering, you know, pop culture just make it really tough. It's like all of a sudden like, everyone's gaslighting and everyone's a narcissism and everything that everyone does can be like <laughs> yeah. reduced to Taylor Swift lyrics, you know? And so it, it is like, you, you are kind of like, am I, is this selfish? Is this self-care? Yeah. You know, you, you don't know. Am I, is it, am I like toxically positive? Am I like, I, you know, it's, there's so much kind of nuance and everything does kind of live on this like kind of spectrum of behavior. But yeah. um, hmm. I think for me, I think if, um, you know, 
the idea of putting, I guess, peace and generosity towards yourself, I think if that's at the center, kind of no matter what you're doing is, is okay. Yeah. So the thing is, like, sometimes you're being, you know, you need to extend your own generosity to, your, to, to you. Yeah. And I think that we have to give ourselves permission to do that. And I think that when we exit the doer space and go to the being space, mm. um, we do think that that's selfish, right? Because if you are a doer, you create an entire world around you in which everyone loves you for your doing, do you know? And so you might have an entire, I mean, I know I have had entire romantic relationships that only existed because I was the doer, you know? Like I, you know, the, um, Something I wrote about in the book was like, you know, you can, your partner, um, every relationship is work, but your partner shouldn't be your job. Yeah. Um, but we find that if you're a doer, you, you take on projects and your projects can be someone you're dating. <laughs> and so I think because of that, we have a lot of guilt to exit into this space of being or giving to ourselves because the mirrors held up around us are almost kind of um, upset or in insulted by us doing that and and so it's a very radical act to gift your own energy to yourself yeah. in, today yeah yeah oh I love that and um, I think this will have to be the last question I asked but I did want to return a little bit to the idea of social media um, especially because I mean we see again and again that comparison to other people can be such a thief of joy. Yeah. Um, and I, I wonder about, um, you know, is there a way that you would you would suggest to the audience um, to maybe stop the comparison mindset, to stop, if, if, if there is a little bit of performativity to the extent there might be in social media, is there a way that we can sort of get past that, that we might be able to transcend it? Asking for a friend. <laughs> 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 it's very, yeah, ultimately, I think um, the less time we spend online, the happier yeah. we'll be. And so I do okay. think it's about probably um, finding, um, you know, like talk about a space that doesn't love you back. Yeah, <laughs> so right. I think going to and seeking spaces that will love you back and will hold you back are critical to exiting mindsets of like, you know, consistent comparison or toxic competition. Um, and I think also probably knowing that you can always alchemize emotions like jealousy into something really helpful. Mm -hmm. So, you know, something a friend said to me once was that, you know, she's like, I, you know, I'm always grateful for when I'm jealous because it's giving me information about what I want. And again, I think that's how you can do that kind of, yes, you can't control the first thought you have about something, which is like, oh, mm -hmm. I want that. But does the next thought have to be, they shouldn't have it? Like, could your next thought be, wow, I'm so grateful that someone is showing me at such an incredible level something that I'm feeling really kind of sparkly about inside and now I want, I, and, and it's, it's affirming for me that where, where I need to work and, and kind of what I need to do next to have that or be in that or open my, uh, the opportunities I can open myself up to, to, to do that. And so I think, you know, a lot of competition is about kind of, I think, alchemizing the first thought into something that is a gift to you and that person. Mm -hmm. And I think to be happy for others is the greatest thing we can give to our world. I think it is the thing that kind of defines somebody who has great energy or like a great vibe or whatever. It is people who are happy for other people. And I think that's something everyone can do and everyone should do. Um, and it, I think it is the greatest act you can give to your community is just to say, I'm so happy you have what you have. And if you like it, I love it. Oh, that's great. Thank you. And to close out, I was wondering if we could ask you to read one of the poems. Yes, um, I will. Yes, please. My first time reading a poem from this book, <laughs> ever. I actually saw these books for the first time in Politics and Prose in real life. Um, I'd never seen like a stack of them because <laughs> I left for New York a couple of days ago and they arrived at my house the second my plane took off. And so I went in and I was like, oh my God, it's in a bookstore. So I got really excited. Um, this is called, you pick this one. I love this one, yeah. This is called Generous. Mm -hmm. Love is a sharing thing. It is not a reward for your efforts. You sit at the table, you pass the potatoes. Mm -hmm. Serve your beloved the gravy. They put some peas on your plate. Mm -hmm. You take more, they take less. 
You take less, they take more. Each of us deserving of our serving. Love is a Sunday dinner. There is enough to go around. Mm. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all so much. <laughs> that was so good. And now for a session on the Play Quotient, bringing play to your workflow, please welcome the cast of Freestyle Plus, Anissa Folds, Mel Rubin, and Anthony Veneziela. Microphone two. This is microphone two. This is microphone. Microphone. This is microphone. Microphone. Hi, mom. Hi. Bless. 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 Yes. Last moment of this session, you're probably thinking, when can I leave? Not yet. Not we yet. We are right there with you. <laughs> but first, we're going to play a little bit. Yeah. We are going to do something called freestyling mm -hmm. with you. Mm. And in order to do that, we will start with a beat. <laughs> And now we're going to add in young niece. Oh, boy. Who is going to freestyle with words you all wrote down. Thank you. So on your way in, you got the prompt of what is the word that comes to your mind when you hear the word play? And we now have your words in this little glass jar that's really heavy and dangerous for me to have. No, no, I got it. Okay. And I'm going to throw out the words one at a time to young niece who will incorporate them over the beats provided by frames. And that is what we do when we freestyle. So, young niece, you ready for your first word? No, but let's go. Okay. Your first word is my trumpet. Okay, here we go. Bump it. The first word out the bucket, my trumpet. I wasn't in band, but you know I was in choir. Soprano, shout out, get higher and higher. Fun and learning. Fun and learning. Hooked on phonics. Speaking words. How ironic. Yeah, I'm on the mic, and you know how I rock it. Yeah, I got this jacket, and it has some pockets. 
camaraderie. Camaraderie. Look around. It's you and me. Upstage at the Atlantic with my freaking family. Just right here where I'm supposed to be. Enjoyment. Enjoyment. Yeah, I enjoyed this. I'm rapping and I like to create a little mischief. We're going to freestyle off the don't. No rehearsal with my friends. Loving here in the circle. Last word. Freedom. Freedom song. Yeah, we all got to get along because we're here in D.C. Yeah, with it going. Yeah, it's young niece and I just keep flowing. Uh. Right on the mic. Yeah, I have to ignite. Yeah, you know I'm going to do it and I'm doing it right. But you know that I can't do it all, all alone. Got to bring somebody else up on the microphone. Woo. That's Give you. Give it up for young niece. That was terrifying. All right. Let's get you in the hot seat to touch. Okay. Okay. All right. Fair enough. All right. Uh-oh. Your first word. This is hard to yeah. hold. Imagination. All right, yes, let's get this together all across the nation. There is one station. It works best when we use imagination. Or maybe link it up. Imagine when John Lennon sang about it. Yes, let's begin. Joy. Ooh. Thank you very much. Looking for a little joy. Everybody knows that the girls and the boys and the non-binaries all get along. When we get to this, let's hear this song. Can we just make some rules for them? Get a non-gender binary in bathroom. Squash. All right, yes, I got a little bit of butternut. Thank you very much. Gonna get it. What? I get a guy with a little bit of squash. All right, yes, now I'm gonna quash all these questions, all these thoughts, all these answers. Oh my God. Okay, your last word is rejuvenation. Ooh. It reminds me of the word that was imagination. If you get it right in your system, it's a rejuvenation. That's right, you get it pumping through all of your nervous system. As Arthur Rhodes said, fear is anxiety plus time. All right, maybe that's exactly what he said. Cheryl Strayed, so far from the path like a child, but that's all right, because we all need to get a little wild. Nice. Make some noise wow. for Tutu. Too much. Make some noise for Young Niece. <laughs> Make pew, some pew, noise pew. for Frames over here. Amazing. <laughs> so yeah, so that's what it looks like when we play together. This is a cultivated, tight-knit group who have frameworks that we kind of use in order to get to that state of being. So that's something we call the foundations of freestyle, right? The beats, the words, getting ideas from you and letting it flow. Getting to a flow state inside of our operating system. You heard a little bit before about the prefrontal cortex sort of being where metacognition helps us to understand and then take those gorgeous fears and sort of put them into words so that the feeling turns into an understanding. Now that part of our brain is super useful and amazing, but today we're gonna subvert it. So, here are some of the agreements we need from you all. First, you're going to surprise yourself. Yeah, you're going to do some stuff. You're like, nope, that's not me. I don't do that. Look at the jacket I'm wearing. <laughs> Second, make everyone look and feel great. Uh, this is the best. Third, listen with curiosity. Follow the joy. Ooh, and when neurons fire together, they wire together. And then finally, take care of yourself. Maybe the most important one, okay? So if anything feels, you're like, yeah, no, I need to sit for this. Great, sit for it. Because we're gonna jump right in and we're gonna start playing by doing an exercise called Take Five. Ooh. So those of you able, please stand up. Please stand up. Awesome. I'm gonna say a number. It's gonna correspond to an action and a noise. And you will do that action and noise when we say the number. So the number one corresponds to a lion noise and pose. One looks and sounds like this. Yeah, it's gonna be super hard for all of us. So here we go when I say the number one. Yeah, that's when I say one. Great, and when I say two, you're gonna kind of do the opposite. It's a mouse. You're gonna bundle yourself up into a center point, and you're gonna go squeaky, 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 squeaky. That is when I say the number two. Squeaky, 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 squeaky. One. <sighs> two. Squeaky, 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 squeaky. Great, and now we're gonna move on to number three. I call it Wiley Coyote. You're gonna clasp your hands to the side, and you're gonna do a shake weight, basically. And you're gonna go like this. When I say three, <laughs> that's when I say the number three. One. Two. Great, and now when I say four, this is the important part, look for your nearest door. This is always good for whenever you're feeling that fear and you're like, I gotta go, right? A couple people already did it, great. Yeah. So, when I say four, uh, yeah. you're gonna look at the nearest door, okay? And that is on four. Look at the door. Four, look at the door. One. Two. Three. Four, look at the door. 
Great. And now we're going to move on to five. Five is a woosa. That's sort of a big, oh, I'm going to let this all out. So you put your hands up, woo, and then you put them down on sa. So that's when I say five, woo, sa. Two, one, four, look at the door. Three, four, look at the door. Five, five, five. Delicious. Go ahead and take a seat. Yeah. Go ahead and take a seat. And I want you to just notice how you are feeling in this moment. How are you feeling? For some of us, we might be like, I was terrified. Uh, that was the worst thing I've ever done. Thanks a lot. Some of us might be like, wow, actually, there's a lot of oxygenated blood flow going through my body now. I kind of feel rejuvenated. I was going to say the same thing. What's up, rejuvenation? Woo! Awesome. Uh, but most importantly, what we hope is that there are some things going on inside of your brain to get you out of your judging brain. So there's these two parts of your brain that really, really t start kicking in whenever we do like communication. And this is great because sapiens are awesome at it, right? We're like, let's tell a story about this lion god and then we'll kill this elephant together, right? So that's how the prefrontal cortex kind of developed over millennia. And inside of that, we have these two parts of our brain. The one is called your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. It's a little bit further back. It's your judging brain. It's the part of your brain that's like, why did you wear the blue jacket? It's a bit much for DC. Yeah. Right? Mm. Or it might be like, why didn't you get your MBA from Harvard? You couldn't even walk across the campus. <laughs> right? And or finally, you might also say like, you should have taken a left on 7th Street. You're now stuck on Main. And it's with an E, not like the downtown. <laughs> so there's always sort of this running dialogue that's happening quite often with your dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. And it's a wonderful part of your brain. Do not get me wrong. This is crucial. Like, we need this part of our brain. But we don't need to be in it so much. Thank you, social media. You don't need to be in judgment all the time. There's this other part of your brain called the medial lateral prefrontal cortex, a little bit further down and off to the sides of your ocular cavities. And that is the part of your brain that's like, I'm crushing this right now. <laughs> this is what I was put on this planet to do. Right? And sometimes we experience that. Not often, but sometimes we do. And for some of us, like, it's when I do yoga or when I'm sailing when I'm coding, or when I'm writing, dear sugar, right? So we get into these states of flow, and when we get into these states of flow, the judging brain gets muted. Uh, uh, to mute that judging brain. It also happens when you play. When you do improv the way we do improv, it is a shortcut to your medial lateral prefrontal cortex. And that's what we're going to do with you for the rest of the time together. Because take five, that was a skosh. You need so much more of it. So let's jump in. Nice? Oh, I'll yeah. If you're feeling good, let me hear you say, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Thank you very much. <laughs> so the way that we play is with improv and freestyle. And freestyle, we're talking about hip hop, as you just saw earlier. So go ahead and just shout it out if you know the answer to this question. Hip hop, where did it all start? What was that? The Bronx, thank you, Mr. in the orange shirt right here. That is correct. The hip hop started in the Bronx, uptown baby, right? So we are standing on the shoulders of these pioneers, okay? In the 1970s, the Bronx was in a economic crisis. A lot of the white people started to drive out, they left, and there was poverty left, there was systematic oppression, there was frustration, and people stopped caring. There was not a lot of love in the Bronx, but the black and brown people in the Bronx took that nothing and made it into something. Thing. And here we have MC Coke LaRock and DJ Cool Herc. And this is what we like to call, we like to call them the founding fathers of hip hop, okay? So in the 1970s, they decided all the world's a stage. They took that nothing and they made it into art. So the abandoned buildings and the businesses became the setting for block parties. The cardboards became uh, the stage for break dancers, b-boys and b-girls. They started to take music and they would set up outside and set up these uh, grand parties. And then the brick buildings became canvases for art. 
graffiti. Okay, so this is an original invitation to a back to school jam hosted by DJ Cool Herc and his little sister Cindy, right? <laughs> So they decided to have this party where they would DJ and have fun. And we like to recognize this as the birthday of hip hop. This is the 50th year of hip hop. So give it up to hip hop. <laughs> Happy birthday. We've come such a long way, right? So the birthplace was at 1520 Sedgwick Avenue in the rec room, all right? Ladies were 25 cent. Men had to pay 50 cent. You know how it is. <laughs> so what? DJ Cool Herc was famous for was taking the break beat. Okay, so at this time, we had what? We had disco, we had soul, we had funk. And there was a part in the song where there would be the drums, the drums. So he liked to elongate that part of the record. So he would take two of the same records and mark where the break beat would happen and just keep it elongated. And that's where the break dancers came in. That's why we call them break dancers because they're dancing to the break beat. And so he was from Jamaica, right? He he took the art form of toasting, and he would go over the mic, and he would start shouting out, uh, yeah, it's Brooklyn in the house. It's Stacy in the house. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, y'all, uh, get down, y'all. And we don't stop. We get down, y'all. Something like that. Yeah. And so he Woo. called up his friend, Coke Rock, and he was like, hey, man, why don't you take over? And he started emceeing, and they started doing this thing that brought all these people together. And it was a beautiful thing that came from nothing, but they made it into something, right? Rap is what you do, but hip hop is what you live. It is a culture phenomenon that has gone on to influence many, many people. And that is what we're doing here. So they would set up and sometimes they would go outside. They didn't always want to be indoors. So they took this thing called beatboxing and started using music throughout their bodies. So Mel, yeah. why don't you come up and show us who these beautiful gentlemen are? Of course. So <laughs> these three gentlemen pioneered uh, the art form of beatboxing, blazed the trail for future beatboxers. Uh, over on the left, we have Dougie Fresh. He was known for his clicks. Uh, he loved incorporating those into his beats. Uh, Bismarck Key is on the bottom right. He did the loose lip, deep bass sounds. <laughs> sorry, orange shirt. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Didn't bring the shield. Uh, and then we have Darren Buffy Robinson in the top right. He did the uh, short inhales. <laughs> <laughs> um, and and they, uh, yeah, they originated the art form and made it what it is today. My personal influence, Kayla Milady, who was uh, in Freestyle of Supreme on Broadway. She's the world champion of beatbox. I always like to shout her out because she, I think she blazed the trail for female beatboxers. So shout out to Kayla. Um, but enough about beatboxers and who we all are. I want to learn who you all are. So remember that first agreement we made today. We're going to surprise ourselves a little bit, okay? Yeah. So if you're comfortable, I'm going to ask you to stand up on your feet. We're going to learn to beatbox together. Yeah. It's going to be amazing. <laughs> I know. You're, the, the, the dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex is already saying, I can't do it. I can't do it. I don't know how to do it. I got to do what with my what? What? Don't do <sighs> Take a breath. <sighs> Woosah. All right, everybody. So I'm going to say the word boots, and you are just going to repeat it back to me. Here we go. Boots. 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 Amazing. Now, I kind of want you to picture the B is like the letter P a little bit. So it's like a B-P hybrid. It's a little, it's a little more aggressive. Uh, and we're going to deepen that O, make it as deep as possible, and try it again. So it's going to sound like boots. 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 Yeah, a lot of pressure behind the lips. If you've ever played a brass instrument, it's it's just like playing that trumpet <laughs> right behind. All right, cool. Now we are going to bring that to a whisper. Remember, a sharp B, deep O. Bring it to a whisper. We're going to chop the word in half. So we're going to have boo, and we're going to have tss. Join me when you're ready. Here we go. Take that dorsal lateral prefrontal cortex. That sounds good. All right. Awesome. Now we're going to bring in our other sound. This is the snare drum, which comes from the word cuts. So everybody say cuts. 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 Great. Now I like to picture, I don't know why, if this works for you, great. I like to picture the C as a letter K. For some reason, C is cute. It comes from the front of my mouth. K is aggressive. So uh, picture that from the back of your mouth. We're going to deepen that C, kind of make it a K if, if you want to. Uh, lower the U sound, and let's try it again. Cuts. 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 
Cuts. Cuts. Awesome. Same deal. We're going to bring it to a whisper. We're going to chop it in half. So we're going to have k over here, t over here. Do it with me. Amazing, and now we're going to bring it all together. We're going to do a beat together. We're going to bring boots and cuts all into the mix. Yeah. Join me when you feel ready. Here we go! <laughs> a little faster. Yeah. Woo! All right, now we're gonna do a little call and response. Let's see what you got. Here we go. Great. Great work. Wow. Again, register where you are right now on your feeling index. How did that feel, right? Oh, gosh. A lot of new stuff in there. I never tried it. I didn't want to try it, and I won't try it ever. Awesome. <laughs> improv. Where did it all start? Anyone out there know where improv started? Orange shirt. Where is it? Chicago, Chicago, Chicago. <laughs> yes, sweet home Chicago. Two for two in the front row over here. Yes, sweet home Chicago. And it was started by this amazing woman named Viola Spolin. She worked at the Hull House, which was a center for immigrant children. And she noticed that the community wasn't as embracing. Chicago, wow, it's come a long way. So it ha wasn't as embracing as it could have been for immigrant children in that community. Go figure. Um, it's not happening today. Anyway, so there they are, and Viola Spolin and it's like, well, how do I help them feel welcomed? How do I help them feel like they belong to this community? I know, theater games. What if we play games where the kids who live in this community are equally terrible at the game as the immigrant kids are? And then we learn together, and we build that up, and we go through discomfort and pain together. Thank you, Arthur. And going through that discomfort together and coming out on the other side and being like, oh, yeah, I'm actually okay. It's called low-risk exposure therapy. And when you allow yourself to experience pain and discomfort, you actually get comfortable with it. So getting comfort with discomfort is the tenant of improvisation. That's what Yes End really does. It just allows you to be like, I don't know where you're going with it, but I'm willing to find out. <sighs> So Yes End really helps us with that, and we're going to do what we do at Freestyle Plus, which is to mash up some of the improv with the, the hip-hop, and that is what freestyling is. So, Nice, you want to lead us through this last one? Absolutely. Okay. All right, so this is one of my favorite things in improvisation, right? We're adding hip-hop and improv together. This is one of my favorite exercises, gibberish flow, because it's before the words. What we're going to do is take nonsense, gibberish, and we're going to see how the music influences to make noises over that beat, right? I think about back to when I was a kid, right? We're, we're having fun, we're jumping off the walls, we're feeling free, and then all of a sudden, you become aware of your existence, and you stop taking up the same amount of space. Cleo earlier was talking about social media and sharing yourselves with people. It gets hard, right? But what we're trying to do is quiet that judging voice, and we're just gonna have fun and take risk. There is no wrong way to do this. Yes. As long as you're making noise over the beat, you are doing it right. You can say nonsense, you can hum, you can sing, you can say the same word over and over again. As long as you're making noise and seeing how that music influences you, you're doing it correctly. Yes. So so really quickly, I just want to do an example of what that might sound like. Uh, Mel, give me a beat. Okay, now if I was gonna see how this music influences me, it would sound something like this. You know, something like that. Yeah, um, let's, four bars. Let's, let's see how a beat might influence Anthony. Oh boy. Zip ba bo ba zip da bo ba. Yeah. Salmonella mama to the salmon jar. What? Miz aba lo ba da ba da do fa. Huh? I don't know now, but now now bizarre. Wow. What did he just say? I don't know. Fire. But that was incredible. All right. 
Well, One more time, stand up on your feet for me. We're gonna take 15 seconds to find a partner. Ready, go! Get a partner, get a partner. Find somebody, be brave. Find somebody you be don't brave, know. Be brave, if you yeah, don't, be brave. If you don't find have somebody a partner, you don't raise know. your hand. Right here, you guys. Perfect. Boom. Great. All right, really quickly, whose birthday comes next? Talk amongst yourselves, whose birthday is coming whose up next? next? Raise your hand if your birthday is coming up next. Raise hand your hand if your, your birthday, birthday is coming next. next. Point to your partner. That person's going first. Woo! Yeah! All right. Take so that, expectations. We're going to take four bars. Mel is going to give you a beat. I'm going to tell you when to go. Mm -hmm. And then we're going to switch and go to our next partner. Make noise over this beat. See how it influences yeah. and you. And cheer for your partner when they're done. And cheer your partner on. Hype them up. Yeah. All right, All right. Mel, go ahead. Here we go. All right, we're going to begin. <laughs> Switch. Switch. Switch partners. The Here next part person is going. Your partner's eyes while they're doing it. <laughs> Terrifying. All right. Here we go. One, Get two, in. three, go. Hit it. Two, three, four. Wow. Yeah. Make some noise for yourselves. Yes. Really quickly, compliment your partner. Tell them what you liked about what they just did. Compliment Set your partner. Love their way. Y'all, Anthony. <laughs> Amazing. All right, go ahead and take a seat right where you are, and Great maybe even give job, a high five guys. to your partner. Yeah. Ah. Uh, yeah. Stay with them. I want you to check New in friend. one more New time friends. with your feelometer. meter How are you feeling right now? Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be terrible, right? I love terrible. Terrible is a great way to feel. You got through it. Okay. So we're gonna take 15 seconds where we just have silence so that seconds. people can just let this experience resonate. And then we would love to hear from you about what landed on you of that experience. And it could be anything, but think of it as like a gem. It's a gem that somehow pressure caused in you in this moment, this experience. And you're like, oh, I wanna share this gem with the room. It's too good not to share, okay? And we have some mic runners who are gonna go. But I want you to take 15 seconds to just collect yourself because there's a lot of modalities of thinkers out there. And the introverts are probably like, I can't believe I'm still here. Yeah. <laughs> so great, so 15 seconds I'm starts right now. And that's 15 seconds. For the power extroverts, I was like, that was a lifetime. <laughs> Why would you do that to me? I think we have someone over here. Great. Oh, oh excellent. So Ty is already up there with yeah. somebody. And if somebody has a, a thing that they want to share as well, he's just over here, happy to go out. But let's hear. Yes, what is your gem? Hi, so I'm Kristen. So I'm actually a, a speech language pathologist, and I work with kids. Crazy. So I'm a little bit more used to babbling than <laughs> most people probably. Yeah. but. This reminds me a lot of how kids actually acquire language in childhood as they oh. start with the nonsense noises. Yes. So that was cool. Thank you for sharing that. Motherese is the sort of base of all language, right? Yes. Love it. Noam Chomsky, you're wrong again. Okay, great. <laughs> I mean, maybe. Who knows? It's still a debate, but I'm pretty sure it's motherese. Awesome. Anyone else out there want to share what landed on them? They're like, oh, this is a gem. I want to... That, and, and it can absolutely be grounded in how you feel. Another don't one. be afraid to talk about your feelings. We're in America. We don't do that. Right here. <laughs> be, right, yeah, over here. Yes. Great. Hi. Hi. Happy to be here. And I think that there are not enough places where it's safe to make mistakes. And as long as you show up, you're good. Mm. And I actively try to incorporate more of those. So I love everything that happened here. Mm. Absolutely. Safe spaces for mistakes. Yes. yes. That's such a great gem. Thank you. Yes, down in the front here. We'll get one of you. We'll, yes, perfect. Thank you. So I will, t uh, my name's Donna. I will talk about how I feel. I'm a meditator. I meditate twice a day, transcendental meditation. And when I come, after I meditate, I feel just very present. And that's exactly. Total different physical experience, but exactly the way I felt at the end of this. I thought, I feel like I just meditated. 
Thank you so very much. That's that flow state. Thank you. That is. And so we have been doing a lot of research around the neuroscience of what we are calling active mindfulness. So there's a lot of mindfulness that's out there that is very um, secluded. And it's wonderful work. It should absolutely be done. But it's based out of monastic practice. And it usually comes from a great, we're going to put food out for the monk as they go up to the cave and just look inside themselves. Awesome. That's not where we live. <laughs> right? So where we live, it tends to be a social interaction. So what if we have mindfulness that's actually active and creates pro-sociality? Mm -hmm. How do we then measure that? And that is what the play quotient is. That's the title of this talk. The play quotient is how much play are you getting in each day and what's the quality of the play that you are getting in? Does it help you to get to a flow state and for how long might you be there with others? The more we tap into the other part where we're almost transcendentally meditating together through play is our hope. So how do we do it? Because there's not enough safe spaces. Mm. We are starting with, let's get into businesses. So we want to make sure that there's a playground in every business that is just this social construct of a safe space to make mistakes. Mm -hmm. And that's why we're here. So with that said, those are three incredible yeah. gems. Why don't we put it into a wrap up? Yeah, let's do it. We're going to take those ideas. So it was safe space to make mistakes. It was also mother ease or, or sort of babble learning language. Uh, and then also uh, sort of like a, a meditative high. Okay, great. Those are our suggestions. We're going to wrap this up with a wrap. Uh-huh, yeah, uh-huh, yeah, huh. uh-huh. It's a safe space. I feel safe to make mistakes. I just want to play, yeah. I feel safe to make mistakes. It's a safe mistake. I'm feeling so shutly swole. It's a safe <laughs> place. And I'm floating on the road. Yeah. yeah. Well, Robert came out, talked about that practice yeah. of getting swole emotionally in action. And then we move through with some Cheryl Strayed. Truly, can you embrace both of these ways? Can you be vulnerable and also fearless? Or maybe you should look around, you're all peerless. But that's all right, we got some transcendental meditation because we all, in fact, need some rejuvenation. How did it come? back from the top of the show that is a magic trick a snake in the tail or with its mouth but it's nothing like mother ease shouting out i'm like now thank you all for coming to the atlantic fest it has been great and now we're gonna take away your breath it's a safe space uh. we did that active meditation Woo. it's a safe space Cause playing is medication. Woo. It's a safe space. <laughs> uh -huh. I feel safe to make mistakes. I hope you had fun playing with us today. Thank you so very much. Woo. What an honor to be here with you all Thank today. Thank you. Have a great rest of your weekend. Enjoy. This was microphone one. This was microphone one. This was microphone one. This was microphone one. This was What an incredible Ooh. session. Oh, what an incredible day. Many thanks to all of today's speakers and everyone at The Atlantic that contributed to this enlightening and thought-provoking experience. Some of the speakers you saw this afternoon will be staying around to sign copies of their books in the lobby. Our bookstore partner, Politics and Prose, will have copies of the books for sale, both in the lobby and at their store, which is located across the street at 610 Water Street. This concludes our arena stage programming, but it is not the end of the day at the Atlantic Festival. We hope you'll take a few moments to check out my agenda for more details about our afternoon programming, including up next at 3.15 on the Pier stage. Join us for Atlantic Watch, where we will be screening the award-winning documentary, Bad Press, followed by Happy Hour on the District Pier at 5.30 p.m. for our 21 and older guests. And at 7.30 p.m. on the Pier stage, you don't want to miss live storytelling with Spike Lee and Jamel Hill. Enjoy the rest of the day at the Atlantic Festival. <laughs>